just start in a one minute. Okay, I think uh, I can just start now. Good evening, everyone, uh, and welcome. My name is Sarah, and I'm the current leader for the Migration Group of the Norwegian Council for Africa. It is my pleasure to welcome you all to this event uh, about internal displacement in Cameroon. Uh, we find it quite important and interesting to shed light on the uh, neglected displacement crisis in the country. Our main aim and objective is to kind of provide our audience with nuanced and trustworthy information about the situation in the country, uh, which is also our main aim and uh, objective with all of our um, events. This event is particularly part of our monthly seminar series called um, Africa Now or in Norwegian Africa Now, uh, which usually takes place every last Wednesday of the month. Uh, all of our, uh, of our seminars uh, and webinars are posted online on our website, on our Facebook page and Instagram, so stay tuned uh, for our upcoming events. With that being said, I'd like to give a warm welcome to our uh, moderator for this evening, Vegard Sjöholm. Vegard is currently working as a journalist for NRK and has previously worked with other organizations such as the Norwegian Church Aid and the Norwegian um, Refugee Council. He has, for instance, been part of conducting the uh, report uh, called uh, The World Most Neglected Displacement Crisis in 2019 and has also covered several topics and stories related to Cameroon. So Vegard, uh, welcome. We are looking forward for you to navigate us through this um, important event. Thank you, Sarah. And um, they're all welcome to this webinar about the situation for internal displaced persons in Cameroon. Uh, the situation in Cameroon was listed as the most neglected crisis in the world last year by uh, the Norwegian Refugee Council. And this list is calculated by using three criteria. Uh, one, the number of displaced persons in a country. Two, the lack of funding to the humanitarian appeals for each country situation, and three, the media coverage of the ongoing conflict in each country. And when all these ratings were added together, Cameroon was listed as uh, the most neglected crisis in 2020 for a second year in a row. So there are many good reasons to why we should uh, take a closer look on what's going on in this part of Central Africa. Tonight, we will mainly focus on the humanitarian situation in Cameroon and the challenges the internal displaced people in Cameroon are facing. Internal displaced persons are often shortened down to IDPs. So just make a note uh, of that if you're not familiar with this abbreviation already, because we will mention IDPs quite often tonight. To help us understand more about these topics, we are lucky to be joined by several people who will share their thoughts on uh, and knowledge about uh, the situation in Cameroon. Um, I will make a closer introduction uh, of the panelists one by one, and they will all get some time to start out with a short introduction each, and then it will be possible for you to ask questions to the panelists. So feel free to ask any questions you might have, do so by writing the questions or comments in the chat, and we will ask the questions or read the comments for you. If you would like to ask questions more privately, you can send a direct message to Hilde Hunolakten. Before introducing our first guest, I will try to make a short summary of the very complex situation in Cameroon. Uh, it is not possible to give an accurate summary, uh, since that would take hours or maybe even days. Um, 
But to make sure that everyone is almost on the same page, I will try to explain what's going on in Cameroon and why people are forced to flee from their homes. Cameroon is currently experiencing three refugee crises at a time. First, they are a host country for refugees from the Central African Republic, uh, in short called CAR. And CAR is uh, bordering to Cameroon in the east. Right now, we see unrest and small clashes in the Central African Republic, and this fresh unsettlement uh, might lead to more people crossing the border from CAR to Cameroon. Secondly, Cameroon is unfortunately struggling with a horrible acts from the terror group Boko Haram, and they are present in the Lake Chad region on the borders between Nigeria, Niger, Chad, and uh, the very north of Cameroon. Many people have fled from the horrible acts of Boko Haram and many of them seek refuge in Northern Cameroon. And third, the last year's armed rebel groups have carried out several small attacks in the two English speaking region, regions in the Western Cameroon. Um, the regions are called Southwest and Northwest Cameroon. We need to go at least all the way back to World War I to understand more here. At that time, Cameroon was a German colony but after Germany lost the World War I, United Kingdom and France, who won World War I, they took control and colonized Cameroon, and they divided the country in two, a British part and a French part. For 40 years later, when the wave of independence hit Africa in the 1960s, the British part of Cameroon, called Southern Cameroons, they got a choice. Either they could become a part of Nigeria, uh, which was another former British colony, or they could rejoin the English, now the French speaking part of Cameroon, and they chose the latter option. However, there were groups inside uh, this English uh, speaking parts of Cameroon who wanted the southern Cameroons to become independent and an own country. Since then, parts of this English speaking minority in Cameroon mean that they are being discriminated by the French speaking government. And this discontent increased for some years ago when the Cameroonian government decided to increase the use of the French language in schools and courtrooms in the English speaking parts of the country. And this created anger among the English speaking minority and also led to the start of armed hostilities. This conflict is still finding place. Schools have been shut down for a long time and civilians are being terrorized by armed men. This is a very short summary of a much more complex situation, and we will not discuss the political parts of this conflict tonight, but rather focus on the consequences and talk about the situation for the IDPs in Cameroon. And to start out, I am pleased and honored to introduce Dr. Christopher Fumunio. He is not joining us tonight as a panelist, but to give an introduction. He is the Regional Director for Central and West Africa in National Democratic Institute. He is from Gusang in Cameroon. He has studied law at the University of Yaoundé, but also on Harvard and Boston in the United States. Dr. Fumunio has joined us here to share some thoughts on how Cameroon deals with the IDPs, lessons learned from the field, and to give some recommendations on the way forward. Dr. Fumunio, the, the floor is yours, or the digital floor is yours. Well, Thank you very much, uh, Vegard, for those very kind words of uh, introduction. Um, and I really want to thank you and Sarah and all of your colleagues uh, for putting together this uh, webinar uh, to shine the spotlight on the plight of internally displaced persons in Cameroon. Uh, and I agree with you that uh, the, the politics is complex, the conflict is still ongoing. Uh, and that for purposes of this discussion, we will stay out of those two areas and really focus on the humanitarian aspects of internally displaced persons and see what uh, recommendations we can come up with uh, that can help alleviate the suffering uh, of this category of persons. You know, my first encounter with IDPs in Cameroon uh, goes back to February, March of 2015, when at the peak of the Boko Haram attacks in the extreme northern region of the country, I decided to travel to that region uh, and to see for myself 
uh, the suffering to which people were exposed. I visited a refugee camp in the Mayo Senegal division uh, and saw for myself how the refugees were being treated, how they were organized, uh, how they were even uh, getting uh, the, the kids in refugee camps were getting access to education and access to food, uh, and how the UN agency uh, in church of refugees was really looking out for people in the refugee camps. And then I traveled back to the regional capital, Marwa. I spent some days in Marwa, spent some days in uh, another local city called Mayo Olo on the border, close to the border with Nigeria, um, and in a number of other northern towns. And I kept asking people, where are the internally displaced persons? I asked the authorities, I asked civil society organizers, I asked even ordinary citizens, and everyone to a person would tell me the story of someone who had escaped the Boko Haram attacks and who was now living in the city, but they would always say they were living with parents or with friends and nobody could actually locate them. And it dawned on to me uh, that these people were not being documented. And little did I know uh, that a couple of years from that 2015 visit, uh, the situation of internally displaced persons in Cameroon would be aggravated uh, by the new crisis that the country now faces in the Northwest and Southwest regions of former British Cameroons, British Southern Cameroons, as you mentioned, uh, since 2016. I would say that the bulk of the internally displaced persons that the country now has uh, actually come as a result of this second conflict. And the fact that the figures range from, in some cases, 700,000 to close to a million, depending on the source, uh, it's also an indication that enough work has not been done to actually document properly who is an IDP and who is not. And I think as we look at those IDPs, we could classify them in two categories. One, the IDPs that are outside the zone, the conflict zones, and two, the IDPs that are within the conflict zones. In both cases though, I must hasten to say that the IDPs that are coming out of this conflict, which unlike the Boko Haram conflict is a conflict within the confines of a national territory, are basically in a twilight zone and they face three separate sets of challenges. With regards to the IDPs that are no longer in the conflict zones, I'm referring to Anglophone Cameroonians who used to reside in the Northwest and Southwest regions, but that because of the conflict are now resident in the other eight regions of the country. They face three sets of challenges. One is the economic and material vulnerabilities because a lot of them have abandoned their place of traditional habitat They've abandoned their businesses and they've now relocated in areas that were foreign to them in the past. Because of that, they're facing economic hardship, but they're also facing material deprivation, especially because for most of them who depended on basic persistent agriculture, they were able to feed themselves when they lived in their traditional economies, uh, 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 places of habitation. Secondly, they're also um, impacted by the basic issue of societal insecurity. By that, I mean that with every um, conflict, the rate of criminality increases. And as people find refuge in big cities and even in smaller towns, they become vulnerable to the criminal actions that can take place even within those communities. Because now you have an increase in unemployed people, you have an increase in people who are dependent on others, 
and criminality tends to go up. And not surprisingly, the first victims of such increase in criminality happen to be the most vulnerable. You all may have read recently the incidents about uh, a, a, a young lady who was killed in Fuman in the Western region, uh, who was an internally displaced person uh, killed under very difficult circumstances. You may also have read newspaper reports about young girls from these communities who are now exposing themselves to prostitution as a way of earning a living as they try to survive in big cities such as Douala and Yawundi. The third challenge that I see uh, in terms of vulnerabilities for IDPs that are living outside of the zone of conflict is that in the particular case of what we can call for purposes of this conversation, the Anglophone conflict or the conflict in the Northwest and Southwest, the IDPs living in other regions of the country are susceptible to being caught in the cross wires of the cultural issues that are part of the conflict. And so there is a vulnerability that comes with being an Anglophone in a Francophone part of the country when some Anglophones are contesting the fact that they ought to belong to the same country or the fact that Anglophone teachers are being sent into Anglophone secondary schools or Francophone judges are being sent into Anglophone courts. And so if we're not careful, this internally displaced persons could easily get caught up in some of the issues, the cultural issues that are part of the conflict. I would briefly, because of in the interest of time, just touch on the third, the my third, uh, the third component of my expose, my introductory expose, which deals with the internally displaced persons who are still in the conflict zones, but who have left the rural areas, the villages that are being controlled by some of the armed groups to seek refuge in the big towns, such as Boya, Limbe, Kumba, Bamenda, that are seemingly more stable than uh, uh, villages in the rural parts of, of those two regions. I think that the IDPs in those regions still face three challenges. One is they're as economically vulnerable as refugee, as IDPs outside of those zones, because they come into cities that are distant from their natural habitats. They have no employment. Economic activity is gone down because of the conflict. And there are no job opportunities for young people who leave villages into the cities. Secondly, there is persistent insecurity because as we now see by the nature of this conflict, no one is safe because from time to time there are skirmishes even in the big cities and people can get caught up and people who are internally displaced who have come from rural areas tend to wander around, tend to expose themselves more because of their lack of familiarities with the cities and could easily be caught up with the increased insecurity that we now see even in the main cities. And the last point I will make is that this category of IDPs uh, amplify the generalized deterioration of the conflict because by the increase in numbers in the populations, even in the main cities, they continue to vehiculate the message that despite the public and official announcements, as long as the conflict continues to endure, as long as there's not a formal declaration of an end to the hostilities, that the conflict will continue to generate more IDPs. My hope is that conversations like this one and webinars like this ones would help shed the spotlight on the plight of IDPs and that collectively we may be able to come up with recommendations that would help the government and the warring parties create avenues to safeguard the lives and the well-being of internally displaced persons. I really want to thank you on your time and we we'll look forward to learning from the panelists as well as our participants, how we could all play a positive, constructive role. Thank you very much and over to you, Vega. 
Thank you for your introduction, Dr. Fumunio. And we are very pleased that you could join us here tonight and contribute to, to more knowledge about what's going on in your home country. As you say, it's very, very important that more people know uh, if we will be able to, if we are to be able to, to do something with uh, this situation. Now we will continue to the panelists. They will get some minutes each to share um, their knowledge and experiences. Um, they all work with different topics and looks on the conflict in Cameroon from different angles. After they have given their introductions, we will open for questions and discussions. So please do not hesitate to ask questions or to give comments. Uh, please feel free to write in the chat or to send a private message to Hilde. Um, we have three panelists joining us tonight, and we will start out by welcoming uh, Clementine André. She works in uh, the Internal Displacement Monitoring Center, IDMC. And as the name tells us, this center is keeping an eye on internal displaced people around the globe. They are based in Geneva and is a part of uh, the Norwegian Refugee Council. Uh, Clementine André is a special advisor in IDMC and holds a master in global migration. She will give us some facts and numbers to understand more about the humanitarian situation in Cameroon. And she will also talk a little bit about the challenges one faces when trying to monitor uh, the ongoing situation there. So please come team, the, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Vigard, and hello to everybody. Thank you so much again for inviting IDMC to be a part of this conversation, this very important conversation. Um, and I, I just like to, to start this, um, this presentation by pointing out something that Dr. Fumunio mentioned, the importance of documenting um, the internal displacement crisis that is ongoing in Cameroon to better understand why it is neglected and what needs to be done basically to shed more light on it and for it to be better funded and for IDPs to receive more assistance than they've been receiving in the past. So I have prepared a short um, presentation that I will share with you. Let me know if you can see my screen. Is this working? Perfect. So just as an overview, Vegard, you already mentioned a few of these. Um, I will be explaining the drivers of displacement. So in Cameroon, we mentioned um, more specifically conflict and violence as the main drivers of, of um, displacement. So this is occurring uh, with armed conflict in the far north region, as well as the violence in the English speaking regions um, of northwest and southwest. To be noted, and this is something as well that Dr. Fumonio mentioned, IDPs um, are fleeing violence um, and they're concentrated in seven regions of Cameroon, far north, northwest, southwest, west, littoral, centre and Adamawa. The majority of IDPs in Cameroon are located in the northwest, southwest, far north region. But something to also mention is the fact that in Cameroon, there's also a lot of IDPs who have been displaced and forced out of their homes as a result of natural hazards. The majority of these displacements are occurring as a result of floods. And a lot of the times what is happening is that these displacements are taking the form of secondary or tertiary movements. So the last event that happened was in 2020 when IDPs who have been previously displaced um, by the Boko Haram conflict in the far north are being displaced another time. And this has increasing their vulnerabilities. Now, some facts and figures for, for Cameroon relating to internal displacement. More people were internally displaced in the first half of 2020 than in all of 2019. This is to give you an idea of the scale of the displacements and the fact that while we are making more progress in documenting these movements, more people are being internally displaced today than they were before. The majority of the displacements in 2020 are taking, the place, uh, taking place as a result of the growing violence in the English speaking regions. To give you an idea, seven out of 10 conflict IDPs in Cameroon have been forced to flee because of violence in the English speaking regions. They're not remaining for the most part, they're not only remaining in the English speaking regions, they're also fleeing to the littoral, the west and central region, for example. To put a bit of a perspective on the regional scale of the conflict, Cameroon is the third uh, country hosting the highest number of IDPs in West Africa. In 2020, there were 111,000 new displacements as a result of seasonal rains, again, as I mentioned before, in the far north region. The rains are intensifying and more people are being displaced each year. 
in comparison, in 2019, there were only, well, only, there were 18,000 new displacements reported um, in, in Cameroon linked to floods. So I think this is an important part of, of the, the whole documenting issue that we have in Cameroon is the fact that in order to understand who IDPs are and what their needs are, we need to understand all triggers of displacement. Um, and something else that I'd like to mention as well is the fact that a lot of the times when displacements are occurring, People are, are moving, but they're also losing their homes. Their homes are being destroyed, be it because of a direct attack where homes are destroyed or be it because of floods. And this is an issue because we then wonder how long will people be displaced for? Where did they, where did they seek shelter to? And these are all questions that we're still asking ourselves. Now to discuss a little bit of prospects for durable solutions of IDPs in Cameroon. Um, education and health facilities continue to be targeted schools closure for approximately for over 780,000 school children. Long-term displacements um, often result, as I mentioned, in housing destruction, which means that when attacks are occurring on villages, people lose their homes, and therefore we're not sure how long they will be displaced for. Because even if their displacement is short-term, when they're returning back to the village, they no longer have a home. And there's also the long-term displacement as a result of the protracted nature of the conflict. You know, we mentioned the Northwest and Southwest regions as having the most IDPs, but if you look at the far North region, even though the, the figures are smaller, people have been displaced for a longer period of time, therefore their vulnerabilities are also much increased. And one last thing is the fact that IDPs hosted are often hosted in overcrowded camps. This is especially true to the far north region. Therefore, they face higher risks of, for example, COVID-19 at the moment, but other communicable diseases as well. And finally, I just want to add on one thing is the fact that in Cameroon, even though we have been getting more numbers, there has been more analysis, there has been a lot of work being done to document uh, what is happening in terms of understanding the scale and the triggers of displacement. A lot of displacements still go underreported. This has hindered the, our understanding of the true scale um, of the situation in the country, which may also point to the fact that it is underreported. Um, but we don't know. So far, we don't know how long people are being displaced for. We don't know where they're being displaced to. We also don't have that much information on disaster displacement. It's not systematically monitored in the country. It's not, you know, we don't get figures to the same level of detail than we do for conflict IDPs, even though disaster events, you tend to displace more people than conflict events. And further, humanitarian organizations have struggled to conduct these assessments and evaluate the scale of, of, the, um, of the security because they're, they're facing constraints in accessing the zones. So starting in 2018, we started to get more data, which may explain the increase in the number of IDPs, but this is also because more assessments were being conducted. And so finally, I just want to end on, on one thing, is the fact that without evidence and data, you cannot prevent, respond, or find lasting solutions to the IDP. Essentially, if, if we don't have the numbers, if we're not able to say who the people, uh, what is the demographics of the population that is being displaced, we're not going to be able to accurately address the issue at hand. So thank you so much. Thank you, Clementine. Um, if you have any questions uh, to what Clementine said or uh, I, well, there are already some questions, so that's good. And uh, it's good questions. So we will come back to those, uh, them later. Uh, if you have more questions, do not forget to ask. Um, thank you, Clementine. And now I will introduce our second panelist, uh, Gilbert Ajebe Akame. He comes from uh, Cameroon, but he lives in Trondheim in Norway. He is a human rights lawyer. Uh, he is a human rights lawyer. lawyer Sorry, he's a human rights lawyer, uh, activist, and youth advocate. And um, he is also the co founder of initiatives such as Contra No Sendi and Solidarity and Development Initiative, uh, in short, SUDE. And uh, so let's take a tour to Trondheim, of all places, and listen to Gilbert, who mainly will be talking about the humanitarian consequences of the conflict in the two English speaking regions in Cameroon. Uh, thank you, Vega. Uh, thank you to the Norwegian African Council for organizing such a, an important event. Uh, thank you, Dr. Formunio, for the uh, very vivid and clear picture that you, you painted of the situation of IDPs. Thank you to the other panelists and to all those who have tuned in from their various locations. 
I appreciate the opportunity to share my thoughts and raise awareness on the very complex crisis and the precarious situation of civilians, especially the most vulnerable women, children, and the uh, IDPs that have left their homes for safety. Uh, my focus will mainly be on the Anglophone crisis. Uh, it is a great thing that the environment for discussions is getting friendlier and more and more people are engaging on the subject. So given the focus of the discussion today is mainly on the situation of IDPs, I would like to start by throwing more light on the nature of the conflict and the impact on civilians and the impact on various sectors causing people to flee their homes. So the, the, the crisis in the English speaking uh, Anglophone regions of Cameroon has been raging for, for over four years now and continues with no end in sight. Yet it has failed to attract international attention. Here in Norway, for example, uh, many people are not aware of the magnitude of the situation, even though somehow there is a connection between uh, Norway and, and the ongoing conflict. Um, elsewhere in Cameroon, the Boko Haram's insurgency in the far north region, the crisis in the, uh, sorry, please. The crisis in the uh, Central African Republic with, uh, which has a shared border with Cameroon's Eastern region, uh, coupled with the effects of COVID-19 have complicated crisis response, slowed down uh, already achieved uh, developmental gains and caused severe hardship to the people. The conflict in the English speaking region itself is uh, very complex, like I mentioned. Uh, an asymmetric conflict with a very powerful, well-equipped army on the one hand, and a complex web of non-state armed groups on the other hand. This makes it quite uh, fluid and risky for, for the civilians who are caught in, in the fighting. The International Crisis Group uh, noted in 2019 uh, that, I quote, uh, violence has claimed around 3,000 lives, displaced half a million people within Cameroon, compelled another 40,000 to flee to Nigeria, deprived 700,000 children of schooling, and left about three in, in, in one in three people in the Anglophone regions in need of humanitarian aid. The violence mainly occurs in uh, civilian inhabited areas, especially in the remote villages and farming areas. I would like to note uh, here that uh, farming is one of the predominant activities of uh, those in the regions. And for those in the Southwest regions where I come from, people are used to spending their time in their farms. Some even have farm houses. Uh, however, these are largely being deserted at the moment. Civilians have been victims of direct targeting. They've been caught in the crossfire amidst the violence uh, in places where they live where they carry out their farming activities and their day-to-day -day businesses. There is also uh, many instances of uh, children being killed, like uh, Dr. Chris has mentioned. Uh, and this is what has caused uh, the most alarm and brought international attention to the, to the conflict situation. Children have been targeted in their classrooms. Uh, there have been a case in, uh, recently where uh, a, a child was uh, killed, uh, burned in flames, and the, uh, the father the child and the image has been on the social media and which has caused a lot of people uh, uh, to be brought into tears. Um, last year also in, on the 14th of February, um, there was a, a massacre in Gabu, they call it the famous Gabu incident, which occurred uh, in, a, in a village in the Northwest region where um, a, a, a family of about 22 uh, were killed as a result of an, an, an explosion. And this, this is just a tip of the iceberg uh, compared to uh, the situation of children and, and vulnerable youths in, in, in the Anglophone regions. On the other hand, also, there has been a massive destruction of civilian properties. Uh, human rights organizations have documented evidence of thousands of civilian properties being destroyed. Arson on entire villages have been documented, the burning of houses, targeting of uh, individuals, uh, targeting of vehicles, uh, targeting of hospitals and, and schools. Uh, the economic impact of the crisis has equally been quite severe. Um, it is important to note that while the Anglophone regions, they make up roughly 20% of the country's population, they contribute significantly to the economy. The region's main agro-business uh, facility, the Cameroon Development Cooperation, 
which used to be the second major employer after the government, is in ruins as we, as we speak. Large plantations uh, producing rubber, palm oil, bananas, pineapples, uh, you name it, have been, uh, are no longer operational. Workers have been scared away uh, and production processes have been sabotaged. Cocoa and coffee farmers have also abandoned their, their, their farms, which used to be a major source of income for their families and, 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 and livelihoods. In all this, uh, education has been the uh, biggest casualty. Uh, however, I would like to follow up with the uh, impact on access to education, which is a major uh, area, an area where I, I lay much emphasis, an area where my organization works into. Uh, so I would like to come back to this in my uh, next intervention. Having said that, um, the consequences of the violence and insecurity have uh, led many to uh, flee their homes. There are reports of over half a million people who fled uh, from the regions into safer urban towns in Cameroon as well as in neighboring Nigeria. So, um, Dr. Chris has painted a, a, a quite vivid and interesting picture of uh, the situation. I hope this, uh, my initial intervention was useful and thank you again for the opportunity. Thank you, Gilbert. Um, then it's the third panelist, Emil Andre Andersen. He's based in Oslo, where he works for the International Organization for Migration, IOM. He will talk about the challenges uh, IDPs and refugees face when they are fleeing their home or when they're trying to resettle somewhere else. Please, Emil Andre, you have our, our attention for the next minutes. Thank you, Vega, and uh, for the introduction, and also thank you to the Norwegian Council of Africa for extending this invitation. So, as mentioned, my name is Emil Andersen, and I work uh, in the United Nations Migration Agency, IOM. Uh, so, established in 1951, uh, IOM is uh, the leading intergovernmental organization in the field of migration and works closely with governmental, intergovernmental, and non governmental partners. Um, we, we function globally, we have um, 173 member states uh, and uh, we, we work, work in a broad, broad, er broad areas of migration mind management such as migration and development, facilitation of migration, regulation of migration as well as forced migration. Um, we are also uh, present in Cameroon. We have an office there, staffing 200 people. Uh, I've had the pleasure of, of, uh, of uh, having a lot of dialogue with my colleagues in Cameroon uh, since this invitation to get information and, and, uh, and updated uh, take on the situation from them. Uh, so, First of all, uh, the question in the title for this event, why is this crisis neglected? That's, that's for someone else than me to answer to, but maybe uh, more importantly or, or equally important is, is finding an answer to or a solution to how to raise awareness of the ongoing crisis and to raise funds for tracking, for tackling some of the most immediate and urgent needs of the suffering IDP population. Uh, based on IOM displacement tracking and its estimates of the assistance needs for the IDP population, uh, unfortunately, only 15% 15 15 of needed funding was found uh, in 2019 and 2020. Now, this is 15% of the, the projects, the, 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 the activities that IOM in Cameroon had seen the need for and intended to go through with. Uh, so the, the S, based on this, uh, uh, these plans, the estimated yearly funding need for successfully reaching all of the estimated number of potential beneficiaries within the scope of IOM's work was more than 17 million uh, US dollars. But like I said, only 15% of this necessary funding was found. Um, Cameroon benefited 
or IOM Cameroon benefit from some surge allocation? Surge allocation is central funds from United Nations headquarters in, in New York, which are allocated uh, to alleviate situations where there is extreme underfunding. So this helped somewhat. However, uh, surge funding is limited and needs to be prioritized and distributed uh, differently from year to year. Uh, the surge funding has not been made available for 2021 for IOM in Cameroon. So we are looking at the 2021 where the underfunding therefore is even further, further worsened. Now we sit in Norway, so I I've, I've thought it worth mentioning that uh, the Norwegian government supported IOM Cameroon's COVID-19 response in 2020 with a 250 thousand dollar donation. This grant uh, has a spending period that goes until the end of March 2021 and has as of yet unfortunately not been renewed. Uh, adding to what Clementine said in her last slide, I would say not only does this underfunding have a negative effect on our ability to assist the, the, the IDP's uh, needs. It, it also prevents us from properly tracking um, this IDP population, not only tracking where they are, but also their situation, their access to uh, necessary, uh, necessary non-food items, medicine, education, sanitation, um, etc. So we are also in a situation where the numbers I'll present from now on are due to tracking of the past, but we have even had to close uh, some of our sub offices very recently, which essentially leaves us blind uh, on parts of the map. And this is obviously very unfortunate. Uh, however, in the far north, we can say uh, to the to total displaced population size has increased from by 97% to almost 500,000 since January 2017. In the northwest and the southwest, total displaced population have increased to more than 750,000 since August 2019. Also, more than 63,000 people have been estimated to have fled into regions to neighboring Nigeria, according to UNHCR. Uh, in the East region that neighbors uh, Kara, uh, a population of approximately 300,000 refugees arrived since 2013, following large clashes and instability in Kara. The population for the most part remains stable in size with few returns and approximately 50% of this population is living in host communities. Recent clashes and tensions follow the election in Kar uh, in January 2021 has led to the arrival of additional persons fleeing conflict into Cameroon uh, with 6,000 new arrivals to Gado refugee camp, which is already struggling to cope. Um, according to the last round of data collection conducted by IOM, IOM Cameroon, in the far north in June 2020, the vast majority of IDPs, about 91%, were displaced by armed insurgency affecting the region. Uh, amongst th those close to three quarters, so 71% of those, fled because of an attack on their village of origin. Natural disasters, particularly flash flooding and seasonal floods, are also an important factor of displacement for 9% of the IDPs. 9% um, of the IDPs were displaced by natural disasters since the beginning of these tracking activities. Finally, uh, a relatively small share of the IDPs, less than 1%, were di di displaced due to communal violence. So, not violence related to the overall conflict, but, but other, uh, other factors. In the Northwest, 
southwest Anglophone re regions, approximately 410,000 persons are displaced due to a security crisis. Almost all displaced households identified in the two regions are displaced due to the ongoing conflict. However, 1% were identified to, to be displaced due to communal clashes also there and natural disaster floods as of August 2020. So these are some numbers and, and based on what I said initially, certainly there are uncertainties connected to these numbers and, and maybe some of my co-panelists sit with slightly different numbers. However, there is one thing I think we must all agree on, that IDPs face significant challenges as a result of displacement. It has significant impacts on the living conditions and access to services of, the, of displaced populations. In the far north, a return intention survey conducted by IOM shows that IDPs face many risks and dangers during, this, uh, during the displacement, including armed clashes, kidnappings, kidnappings uh, and arbitrary arrests and detention, and the presence of mines of, on roadsides. These challenges have the potential to create lasting psychological trauma. Displacement has forced IDP households to adopt negative coping mechanisms and reduces their standard of living. 87% of displaced households have had to skip meals while 65% did not eat for days at a time. Lack of food often forced IDPs to take out loan, buy food on credit or beg, something which obviously puts them in an additionally vulnerable situation. Furthermore, two thirds of IDP households, 64%, never received any form of humanitarian assistance. 64% never received any form of humanitarian assistance. Of those who did receive assistance, 44% uh, percent received this assistance, uh, th this aid over a year prior to being surveyed. So even amongst the ones that have received some help, it's been a long time since they received any kind of help. In the Northwest, Southwest, displaced persons face several challenges. There is a great need for emergency assistance to assess, to, to address the basic needs to affected populations, including the need for food, water, sanitation, and hygiene. I think those are my initial remarks. I hope, hope it uh, added something to all, all which was said already by my co-panelists. Thank you. Thank you, Emil. Um, and uh, we've got a comment on on numbers, so let's um, let's stick with the numbers for for a little while, and maybe Clementine also can add because IDMC is also working on on numbers. It's a comment from Ton Borge, who is a professor at the University in Tromsø uh, in anthropology, um, and he he find the numbers presented very low, and, and he he shows to an example where, where people from Central African Republic, um, they, they are afraid, well, they don't want to be associated with being from CAR. Um, uh, we just have to put in there that uh, refugees and IDPs are in the statistics, at least, classified yeah. as two different groups. Refugees yeah. are crossing borders while IDPs are internal in one, in one country. But he also yes. mentions that there are people from the southwest region who stays in, in Gaundre, which is in, in the north of uh, Cameroon. And they don't want to identify them as IDPs because they fear the consequences. What can you say about this, this challenge, that the security challenge, that people don't want to identify themselves as IDPs or refugees? How does that affect your job trying to monitoring and understanding the situation? I mean, as with, as with any survey, surveying, well, in that type of context, uh, for the collection of data to be appropriate or the, the results to really reflect the real, reality on the ground, there has to be trust, you know. And it, it is not a surprise for me when there's a, 
when, when there are conflict, like when we get different numbers than other surveyors. Um, and, and I think uh, the professor Trond Wolge has, has a good point. I mean, um, we, we are on top of struggling with capacity for doing good surveying. Um, uh, there is there is always going to be the element of trust. When when someone asks you a question, does it pose a risk to, risk for you to 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 give a certain answer? But but this this is um, this is a reality that we we live with in this kind of surveying all the time. So whether our numbers are higher or lower, uh, one thing that is certainly measurable that is that there are tendencies in one direction or another whether there is an increase or decrease. Uh, and overall, uh, the numbers are high and, and, and the, pressure, uh, the pressure in this region has increased. The number of IDPs ha has increased and that's something anyone measuring this can agree on. What do you think, uh, Clementine? Are the numbers too low? No, I mean, I, I agree with what Hamid was saying. I think it's... Uh, I think the big issue as well in terms of capturing the displacements in Cameroon is the fact that you have, there's not kind of a harmonized national IDP registry per se. So therefore you have different sources and different organizations, you know, be it um, o, uh, OCHA or IOMDTM or other organizations that are doing data collection on different um, areas of the country. And then you have IDPs who are fleeing from Northwest, Southwest, who sometimes go to the far North, who sometimes go to other regions. These assessments are not being conducted at the same time. Therefore, you always have a risk of either capturing the same person in two regions at the same time, which is something that you also always need to mention about these figures. In terms of they're too low or they're too high, it's it's difficult. You know, it's uh, it depends on how the assessments are conducted. And you also mentioned, you know, there is a fear of of being identified as an IDP or being identified as a as a refugee. I think this is an important uh, part of, of data collection and the fact that these assessments, when they're done and when they're done properly, there there is an element of confidentiality that is associated with it. When you read the numbers and when you see the assessments or the the data sets, you never have the name of somebody or you're never able to identify who they are. So I think that's an important component of of data collection and, and humanitarian response in in tracking these displacements is the fact that you're usually not and you're you're not supposed to be identified as such and you're not supposed to be tracked as such unless you're working for a humanitarian organization. So I think that's, a, that's an important part of it. The numbers being too low, I would say that organizations overall and systems in Cameroon have improved their data collection. Back in 2018, we barely even had any figures um, on displacement for the Anglophone regions. And all of a sudden we gain access to, to assessments and therefore the figure increased a lot. So I think it really depends on, you have to look which sites are being assessed when we do the assessments? Um, what is the scope and you know, is it a small population that we're assessing? I think all these need to be looked at and looked at the methodologies that are used when, when coming up with these numbers, basically. Uh, but why is it important for IDMC uh, to keep track on the numbers of, of IDPs? Why, why do you do this job? Well, I think, first of all, you need to, to, you need to be able to know how many IDPs are in a certain place to be able to then gain some type of, of accountability as well on, on, you know, there it is at the end of the day, IDPs and internal displacement falls under the falls under the ownership of the government as well, because unlike refugees, they don't have an international status, therefore they're not protected under international law. It falls under the government's responsibility. And if we're unable to be able to provide accurate numbers and be able to monitor this appropriately, then we're not able to you know, give this information essentially. And so I think also it's a matter of being able to, to tell the scale of the displacement. You know, we have internal displacement figures for other countries in West Africa and Central Africa. It's not the same monitoring that is being done, but it's important to be able to say, you know, this is how they compare. This is how we can learn as well from different internal displacement situations and different crises. So I think that's, that's basically my, my response. Uh, yeah, I will just add one more comment from uh, Professor Vorge. Uh, he says that Cameroon is a country with open borders. People have family in the neighboring country. Mobile adaptions are tradition, and many doesn't have uh, identity cards. And 
ethnic groups are split by borders. And that's some of the reason to why I, uh, the distinction between IDPs or refugees doesn't yeah. make much sense here. Um, this is common to, to the um, uh, distinction between the two groups. Uh, but let's move a bit forward. Um, there's a question uh, about why do diplomats and the media not focus uh, on Cameroon as we see, as they do in, in, in uh, Myanmar, Burma, uh, DRC, uh, Central African Republic, and Sudan when it comes to IDPs and consequences of war. I will challenge you, Gilbert. You, you live in Norway. You, you look on what's happening in your home country uh, from um, a Norwegian perspective, sort of, uh, but also a Cameroonian perspective. Um, do you feel that people in Norway and Europe care about what's happening in your country? When you say you're from Cameroon, is it only football players they can mention, or do they actually understand and, and care about what is happening in your home country? Thank you, Vega, for that uh, question. Uh, I think uh, people all over the world should care uh, about conflict anywhere. Uh, there are both moral and uh, strategic reasons why people in Norway should be aware about the situation and uh, why people around the world should care. Uh, the crisis, first of all, uh, is a humanitarian disaster, like many have uh, stated, with a devastating impact on women um, and children. So uh, the world has a moral duty. I believe people around the world have a moral duty to ensure that people who share common uh, humanity uh, can in this age and time uh, have a decent way of living. Education, I know in Norway is a very uh, important uh, consideration. Uh, internationally, education is quite important for the uh, emergence of people, both from uh, poverty and uh, education also uh, helps people uh, uh, to be able to uh, live within a culture of peace. So I believe uh, education lovers, uh, peace lovers around the world should care about the crisis, in, in, be it in Myanmar or in Cameroon or in, uh, in Sudan. Uh, Norway, like I mentioned, is a humanitarian country that champions uh, ideals of human rights, <laughs> equality, equity, and justice. Um, so I, I believe that uh, Norway has a responsibility, I mean, an international responsibility uh, to uh, be involved around the world. And I'm sure the Norwegian government uh, has uh, been involved. I heard uh, some time ago that Norway was actually playing a part in uh, trying to find peaceful solutions for the crisis itself. Uh, more so, like I mentioned, that there are equally uh, strategic reasons why uh, people in Norway and uh, other parts of the world should care. Uh, Cameroon occupies a strategic uh, position in, uh, in Central Africa and uh, around the uh, Lake Chad uh, Basin region. Cameroon used to be uh, one of the uh, only stable countries in Africa. Uh, it used to be uh, referred to rather in relative terms as the beacon of peace in Africa. Um, more so, Cameroon uh, is a major economic hub in the region. Uh, with the port facilities that serve serves other uh, neighboring countries uh, like Chad. So I, I believe that uh, Cameroon is a, is a key partner for international actors. Cameroon is equally uh, one of the strategic partners in the fight against Boko Haram and uh, the fight to ensure security around the Lake Chad Basin region. So yes, I believe there are strong reason, reasons why people uh, should care, people in Norway should care uh, about what's going on in Cameroon. Thank you. Uh, does that answer the question, Vega? Yeah, very okay. good answer. Thank you. Yeah. I would like to ask Clementine, because now um, um, Cameroon, uh, we were talking about media coverage, like uh, do, do people care? Do, do the media care? And uh, one of the factors that made Cameroon the most neglected crisis um, last year and the year before was the lack of media coverage. But another factor is, is the number of IDPs. And, now we were starting in 2021. Um, the the conflict is still present. Uh, do you believe that Cameroon also can be rated as the most neglected crisis uh, this year, uh, or has there been any improvements? 
No, I think that's a that's a very good question, and and unfortunately, I do think it's still going to be uh, part of the the you know the countries in the world that are the most neglected in terms of the crisis. One because of the number of IDPs, as as you saw during my presentation, the number has kept continuously increasing in the past three years. Attacks are still ongoing. There's basically reports of daily attacks with displacements, and and the displacement reports are very high for Cameroon. You know, I. As part of my, my daily job, I, I look at other countries as well in the region, and I feel like whenever I come across reports for Cameroon, the displacement figures are very high. Each attack displaces approximately 2,000 people every time. And I think this is quite significant, and it's it's not necessarily mentioned in report, or it's not necessarily, you know, found by media. But I do feel as though, and, and I'm not sure if the other panelists feel the same way, there has been more international um, attention being brought to the to the violence that is unfolding, especially in the northwest and southwest regions in the past year, as well as governments being more involved in the dialogue as well, and then you know pushing for more attention being brought to those regions as well. So I think in terms of the media coverage, maybe Cameroon won't necessarily mark as as low as it did in the past years in terms of the the gravity of the conditions that IDPs are facing following their displacement. I think that hasn't necessarily improved or, or changed much because the, the violence hasn't hasn't decreased um, in the past few years. So I think it's, uh, it's important to point that out. I'm not sure if that replies to your question. Yeah, thank you. Um, there, there's also a question about the state of food secure, security uh, in, in Cameroon. I don't know, Gilbert, you, uh, I guess you are in touch with, with um, family and friends in Cameroon. Do you, do you know anything about the, the state of food security in, in, in Cameroon, um, if not on a national level, at least on a, on a local level? Uh, what I can say about that is that uh, if, if there is, of course, uh, in any conflict, there would be uh, there are shortages like uh, when it comes to concerns food and nutrition. Uh, however, I, I, I could say that in the rural villages where uh, people's uh, subsistence means of have been destroyed. And uh, of course there are still people who, uh, despite the violence have uh, decided to, to remain in these uh, uh, warring villages. So in these cases, there are obviously, uh, you know, shortages of food, but I'm quite sure that uh, uh, organizations, uh, maybe like the World Food Program who are documenting issues about shortages would be uh, more reliable in terms of providing uh, uh, such details about numbers, about uh, people who are actually uh, uh, staying, staying um, days without eating. I, I'm not quite sure about the situation in the, in the northern regions, but uh, uh, these regions uh, 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 also having uh, problems with uh, uh, sometimes uh, 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 drought. These regions are, are mostly in the arid, arid parts of the country, so there are always uh, problems with hunger, especially during the dry seasons. So I think, uh, especially in the areas where Boko Haram operates, uh, there are obvious issues of food shortages there. Yes, and we have to remember that in Cameroon, many many people are small scale farmers, and and they produce their own food. And when they have to flee their homes, they also um, they also travel far away from, from the farmland and that creates consequences. Uh, I don't know if you have anything to add there, Clementine, uh, because you also mentioned that people flee due to climate change. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and no, I was just going to jump on what Gibel was saying is, is the fact that food security as well, we have to look at it and then we have to analyze what is the impact of longer drought periods on displacement as well? Because I think this is something that is still, you know, we're still, it's, research is still being done and there are a lot of difficulties in, in tracking these movements because a lot of the time drought will have a long-term impact on, on movements of, of populations, but it's still something that goes underreported. You know, sometimes we will see reports of, of um, families being displaced or being forced to move because of lack of livelihoods or because of food insecurity. And, and while this is not necessarily found in the, in the big figures, you know, linked to conflict or natural disasters such as flood, these slow onset hazards in the long run do have an impact on displacements. But for the time being, it is, it is quite difficult to track those. I know that IOMDTM, for example, has their transhumance tracking matrix that they've implemented in the country, which basically looks at movements of, of farmers and 
and tries to kind of predict what will be future movements of, of displacements linked with drought. But uh, it's, it's a difficult thing to track. And I think it's important to, to point it out as well as, as, you know, as we move forward as well in discussion. Thank you. Um, Emil, um, parts of Cameroon experience instability and, and great challenges, and that might do something with the mindset of people and how they look on the future and how, how did this affect a population or, or people in Cameroon when they, when they see problems in their own country and it never ends, it, or it might seem like it will never end. How, what do you do? What does that do with a local society or a yeah, municipality? Yeah, I mean, uh, I, I think the answer to this question is is not very different. Uh, uh, it's not very, very different in Cameroon than to to similar conflict crisis situation in, in other countries. Um, and I think. Additionally, like what, what my introduction was, I pointed a lot at underfunding. Um, there, there's, a, there's a difference between a conflict where basically the, to, to a large extent, the international community, including the, the United Nations agencies, as well as, as well as other humanitarian NGOs, just aren't able to be present uh, to the same degree as in, in the conflict in a neighboring co country, for instance. Uh, so, so I think um, we need to be able to raise this awareness. I'm not sure it's important if the public in general is so much aware, because in reality, the, 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 the funds for such work comes from governments. So, so, um, so it, it really needs to be addressed from, from the point of view of uh, getting more people on the ground, getting things done, giving them hope in the sense of being able to show them that there can be a positive development, if only for short periods of the time. Um, tracking, getting data, you had a question there. Why, why is it so important? Well. It is important for that reason. If we cannot present to governments the reality on the ground, how many people are we talking about? And what is their situation? And then put a price tag on this. Because that's, there is an economic aspect to this also. If you cannot present that in a, in, in a believable way to donor governments, then, then there is no way forward. And like I said, now, now we're even, even at the point where the funding is so low that we are even struggling to have the resources to do proper tracking. So I, I tried to invite some, uh, some people from the Norwegian Ministry of Foreign Affairs to join this event. Um, sad to say they couldn't make it, happy to say that they're interested in taking a meeting. Uh, so even that is something. So uh, it, it's a difficult, question to answer, but I think the, the focus should just be on, on reaching out and, and keep pushing and presenting data. It seems kind of like a cold response to say we have to represent data, but that's the, that's the reality of, of, of this. You have to present data for a government donor to even see the need. So, yeah. And and as a journalist, I can, I can also add that data and statistics is very helpful when doing journalism yeah. on, a, on a conflict and a journalist uh, or articles and journalism is very important when the politicians are making decisions and when you are inviting the Ministry of Foreign Affairs to a meeting, uh, then it's important that it's also been covered in the media what happens and, and that also just, people are aware. And just, also just to add, in, in a sense, and don't get me wrong, conflicts are competing for donors' attention. In a conflict that is well documented, it is just a conflict that, for that reason alone, maybe even, might be more likely to get good funding. And when the situation now is that we are struggling to even get a good data, uh, it makes it even more hard, more difficult to, to, to get the message across what the need is, 
but that's the work. Thank you. Um, let's go back to the Q and A. Uh, there's a question. Um, I don't know if you can answer this question, Clementine, but there's a question about uh, if Cameroon is receiving refugees from the recent post-election violence in, in Central African Republic. Uh, CAR is another country uh, neglected by the media, but uh, at least uh, the biggest newspaper in Norway, VEG, had a large article about the situation where they talked to um, the uh, regional director from NRC, Norwegian Refugee Council. Um, and there, there is uh, new uh, violence going on in CAR. Do you see any patterns or uh, any sign for, for people fleeing from CAR to Cameroon right now? Sure, yeah, I mean, and, and before I, I begin answering your question, I think it's also important as well to, to look into that situation, you know, beyond Cameroon. I think CAR at the moment is a humanitarian situation that deserves more attention and that has, you know, given all the, the data that we're receiving, the information that we're receiving, a lot of people are in need right now. And, and like Cameroon, the country is lacking funding in terms of humanitarian funding. And I think it's just to put it out there that this is a, a situation that is unfolding at the moment and that is worsening. And I think more information and more, more attention needs to be put as well on CAR. In terms of the, um, the relationship between people fleeing from the Central African Republic into Cameroon, this is not necessarily something that at IDMC, because we focus on internal displacement, we look at closely. We have seen reports of, of um, tens of thousands of people coming into Cameroon. For several weeks, there were also issues in terms of um, transportation networks being blocked off, um, which resulted in difficulties for people to, to move across that border. Um, in terms of what we can say in terms of trends, you know, there, there has been examples when there are cross-border displacements of, of refugees who then arrive into a, a community. And what you have to understand is that a lot of the time, these are, are communities that may not necessarily as well um, get along. And there may be clashes that might be reignited as well for, for communities moving cross-border. And so sometimes in some cases, I'm, I'm thinking of the case, for example, of, of the border between Niger and Nigeria, where there have been um, cross-border displacements from Nigeria into Niger, and then that resulted in internal displacements. And I think this is where the, the tracking and the monitoring is important, because usually you will know that one person is leaving from Central African Republic coming into Cameroon, but then you don't really know where they go or what happens to them. If they're being hosted in host families, if they're in camps. And I think if, as long as we're not keeping track of those movements from beginning to end, we're not able to say they were displaced once more and therefore became an IDP as well within Cameroon. So I don't know if that applies. Uh, we talked about the future and um... And uh, Clementine mentioned uh, there, there is 780,000 um, kids who can't go to school. And I know, Gilbert, that, that you, uh, you uh, this is a topic very close to your heart. And um, what does that do with a whole, with, with a country when, when a whole generation, or at least in, in a region, can't go to school. Uh, we know the debate in Norway when, when the kids were held back from school because of the pandemic, but in parts of Cameroon, kids haven't been able to go to school for, for months or maybe even years. Uh, yeah, w what are your thoughts about that? Hi, Vega, thank you. I, I think it's obviously, it's heartbreaking for everyone, for every uh, lover of education, and I'm sure many people would support uh, kids going to school. Um, First of all, education is a fundamental uh, human right. Um, it is one of those rights uh, which uh, there are exceptions for derogations, even in situations of emergency like what we are having. Uh, and this is not uh, only a Cameroonian problem. Uh, according to UNICEF, there are about 27 million children uh, who are out of school in conflict zones around the world. So yes, I think uh, the issue is uh, one of international concern, the issue about education for children. Um, and it's also something that's placed uh, 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 at the top of international attention. Uh, so um, the uh, uh, governments around the world, they've taken uh, uh, made declarations like when it comes to the uh, sustainable development goals, uh, to um, uh, taking responsibilities to ensure that uh, there is 
equitable access to education for, for, for all people around the world. Um, in, in, in 2018, Cameroon signed up to the Safe School Declaration, which is an inter intergovernmental uh, political agreement that outlines a set of commitments to uh, strengthen the protection of education from attack and uh, restrict schools uh, to be used for military purposes. So the, this uh, declaration seeks to ensure that there is continuity uh, of safety in schools, even during uh, times of conflict. Interestingly, uh, this, uh, the first international conference for safe uh, schools was held right here in, uh, in, uh, in Norway. So I think everybody has a responsibility to ensure that the, there is continuity of education, even in times of conflict, especially for, for children. Both the government as well as the non-state actors who also have an obligation to ensure access. Uh, um, we have seen uh, during the conflict that it became clear that people or, or, or actors who uh, prevent people from going to school, they lose credibility and, 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 and their standing in front of the international community. So uh, I, yes, I believe it's uh, there is a need for 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 lovers of education uh, uh, to to take initiatives. I know organizations that are intervening on the ground, like uh, uh, UNICEF and uh, uh, Plan International, UNDP. They support out of school uh, learning initiatives in Cameroon. UNICEF, for example, supports uh, community learning initiative. They supply safe uh, learning uh, uh, spaces for children in these uh, conflict areas. Uh, and they equally procure learning material. So uh, with the COVID situation right now, uh, there is more uh, uh, talk about how to provide distant learning solutions. The, I, I, I've, I've read that the uh, Global uh, Partnership for Education is working alongside UNESCO to support distant learning initiatives for Cameroon. Uh, these initiatives like this should be uh, further strengthened in my opinion, uh, and extended especially to areas where the needs are, are greater. It remains a challenge, obviously, uh, not just for Cameroon, but for the, 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 the entire world. So my organization, like you, you mentioned, uh, uh, equally you know, uh, focuses on education. We provide access to a space, uh, tutors, and material for, 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 to help out of school uh, learning children. So uh, I believe that it's a clarion call for, for education lovers to put our hands on deck uh, to ensure that access to protective uh, education, uh, protective learning, especially for children in the most challenging uh, circumstances and whose families are uh, in the position, are not in the position for to maybe move them to more secure locations to, 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 to learn. So I believe it's a call for not just uh, the international community or people outside of Cameroon, but also for Cameroonians to prioritize uh, education before thinking about seeking for political solutions to the to the crisis itself. Thank you. There's a question, and I don't know who want to answer it or who feel that they can answer it, but there's a question saying that, do Cameroonian IDPs care about the international neglect? Do they, do they feel strongly that people outside of their country should know and care about the displacement crisis? If not especially for Cameroon, uh, is it maybe possible to answer that question more in general that uh, what do people in a country where there's conflict and, and you kind of experience that maybe your neighboring countries care, but it's not on the top of the UN agenda or at least not in the Security Council or it's not uh, covered by the media uh, outside of West Africa, and in, 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 in this case, um, maybe Gilbert, maybe you can try to answer uh, on behalf um, of very many people, but at least do, do, do they care about it? Or do they, um, yeah. Okay, I might, I might attempt that. Do IDPs care? Uh, I think uh, when, it, when, as it, when it concerns people who I need for uh, basic means for subsistence, there will be obvious, uh, there will be an obvious need for them to look for means to, to get that help from anywhere. Um, I'm sure both the Cameroonian government and the uh, international agencies that are on the ground intervening, I'm sure they are providing uh, this, uh, 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 the aid that these IDPs might need to maybe uh, uh, be able to uh, 
you know, to eat and be able to have a good sanitary situation or, 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 or learn. So if you ask me, I'll think, uh, yes, IDPs would uh, be interested in, uh, in people caring about their situation. One thing I would like to note is the fact that uh, sometimes I, I've also seen someone ask about what the Cameroonian government itself is doing. So I, I think because the Cameroonian government is one of the protagonists in the conflict, there is often a reluctance to, uh, for people to identify with the government's humanitarian actions. Uh, I'm sure some other people will share this uh, view. However, yes, the government too has launched certain initiatives um, to provide relief and, and uh, subsistence material for people in need, both in the uh, 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 active conflict areas and uh, in areas, other areas to where the IDPs have moved into. Um, however, uh, people uh, who are obviously in need would uh, welcome relief, like I mentioned uh, from anyway. Um, the government also recently launched uh, this uh, humanitarian uh, or, or, or reconstruction initiative. And uh, people have questioned this initiative. People have asked why focus on reconstruction at this time rather than maybe focusing on providing a solution for, for the crisis. So all in all, I think uh, some people would think that it's better for, uh, the, for outsiders or for the international community which has a humanitarian uh, 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 goals to intervene in situation of conflicts, uh, provide uh, relief and, and uh, the UN being an international organization which is working in the interest of people everywhere in the world. I think they have a, a, a duty in, together with other uh, humanitarian countries like Norway. I think they have a responsibility that they have uh, 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 taken up upon themselves to intervene, and I'm sure people welcome such interventions. Thank you. Thank you. Um, there's a question about what, uh, what are the international organizations that are currently responding to the crisis in Cameroon? I think that's quite many organizations to kind of start to list, list it up. Um, but what have they been focusing on? Um, and what challenges are they facing, I, I would like to add. Um, maybe you can answer that, Clementine, or? Yeah, no, as you mentioned, I mean, there, there are several, many um, organizations present on the ground, you know, including uh, Emile's organization, IUM, who does excellent work for, for the tracking and the monitoring of, of uh, internal displacement in the country. Um, there are several organizations, as Gilbert mentioned, that focus on uh, children, IDP children, and their needs, including at UNICEF. There's also several um, organizations that just focus overall on protection and the delivery of aid. Some of the main issues that they um, speak about when we speak to them is the fact that there are a lot of uh, security constraints to their, to their programs. This is as a result of, if you're looking at the Northwest and Southwest regions, a lot of the times these regions are not accessible. Um, they're also often targeted. Uh, humanitarian workers are often targeted in the country, which is an added constraint to their work as well. Um, so I think this is something as well that we didn't necessarily speak about today, but is, is something that is quite significant uh, for Cameroon, but overall for the, for the West Africa, cent West Central Africa region is the fact that humanitarian workers uh, have been and continue to be targeted as well by, by armed groups. Um, and, and I think this is an issue as well in terms of, of their delivery and, and the programs that they're trying to implement to assist those most at needs. Thank you. And um, I can follow up with another kind of questions. What can you say about the situation in the region? Uh, we've talked about Central Af African Republic. We mentioned Boko Haram, uh, and then we can also mention Nigeria. Uh, Nigeria and DRC is, the next countries. Uh, what can you say about uh, the situation in the region as such? So overall, I would say in, in West Africa and Central Africa, which is my area of focus, the, the main displacement crises at the moment, there's the Central Sahel, uh, the Liptakugurma region, which is essentially the, the tri-border region between uh, Niger, Mali, and Burkina Faso. In the past two years, um, this specific region of, of West Africa has been experiencing some of the highest levels of, of displacement um, ever recorded on, on the continent. Um, this is one of the main drivers of displacement on the continent. There's obviously the, the Boko Haram insurgency, but what's interesting is that previously, 
the Boko Haram insurgency used to be kind of the, the sole driver of displacement on the continent. Um, and ever since a few years ago, there is now the Anglophone crisis, as we mentioned for, for Cameroon, but there is also the, the violence that is unfolding in the central Sahel region. And more and more we're seeing signs as well that this, you know, the crises are, are increasing in scale and displacements are increasing in scale, but it's also expanding geographically. You know, there are reports of violence in Northwest and North Central Nigeria, which didn't used to occur two years ago. Um, there are also reports of violence occurring in, in Cote d'Ivoire and other, other coastal um, African countries. So I think it's it's important to note that, yes, there are these these crises that are occurring and they're, they're getting bigger, but there's also more of them, which is difficult in terms of being able to, to assist all those in need. Thank you. I think uh, we're about to sum up this uh, webinar. Um, just one last question, um, maybe to all of you, but what can the international community do to help Cameroon? Like, is it, what's the most important thing to do? Is it funding? Is it awareness? Or what, what can be done to help Cameroon in, in, uh, in this situation? Uh, and especially the people of Cameroon, not only the country, but the, the people living there. Uh, yeah, I should go first. Uh, I am not sure why uh, the the situation in Cameroon is uh, said to be neglected, or why why it's different from a situation in a different uh, context. But uh, I'm sure there are uh, reasons that are uh, that the uh, the international development uh, community. Uh, 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 chooses not to focus on Cameroon. So, but uh, yes, obviously, I, I would say again that uh, a humanitarian crisis in Cameroon is, uh, is as equal as a humanitarian crisis in Burma, for example. So, I think um, uh, it could be a, it could be a situation of uh, priority and budgeting for uh, this. Uh, International development uh, organizations, but I think this the uh, the, uh, this, the situation for children is a uh, 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 a serious predicament. The situation for uh, the uh, education, the, the issue about uh, access to education, I I don't uh, know which other conflict around the world uh, where the education has been impacted as is as it is the case in Cameroon right now. In in Cameroon, the focus uh, education has been a Specific target, it's been targeted, and and uh, it, it, the the destruction uh, in terms of uh, the ability to 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 access education is really in very high proportion. So I think that uh, that should be, uh, of course, a top priority. And uh, uh, of course, I know that for people to be able to to think about going to school, they must also think about having food to eat. So uh, I think they are. Uh, um, overall, there should be a rethink about the situation and uh, uh, priority should be given to uh, uh, these people who find themselves in, in very difficult situations. Thank you. Uh, I would like to rephrase my question before Clementine and, and Emil Andrea is, is answering. I would rather ask why, why should uh, Europe or Norway uh, or the international um, society, why should they care about what's going on in, in Cameroon? Uh, Clementine, you, you could go first. Well, I mean, why should they care? I think the past hour at least has, you know, kind of summarized why they should care. You know, we've discussed the conditions of displacement, we discussed the, the numbers and everything. And I think, as Emil mentioned, it, it is an underfunded crisis. Um, why? I'm not entirely sure. I think you, you mentioned a few uh, awareness, not necessarily being there yet in terms of, of what we need to, uh, to do in terms of awareness to get um, the funding that we need to assist the people. Um, I think also something 
that needs to be said is, is the fact that a lot of the time we're still seeing these crises and responding to these crises as a um, kind of a humanitarian response. I think also a lot of time we need to reshift the focus and ensure that the local populations are included in the response and are included in the, the capacity building as well of these systems that are in place. And you know the different organizations that are created. And Gilbert, you mentioned your organization is the fact that you know you you asked earlier as well are IDPs caring the fact that it, it is a neglected crisis and are they caring that there's not a lot of funding and attention given to it? I think that the question there is the answer is the fact that we need to include their voices as well a lot more in, in the awareness that we do on the issue. And, and I think a lot of the time, you know, yes, numbers and, and data, I'm, I'm the first advocate for that and, and documentation, but I think figures are not the only way to document. There's also personal stories, there's, there's specific stories that we need to tell and I think, that is a way as well of, of raising awareness and being able to, to give that perspective from the ground. Thank you. Emil, I would, I would also like to add, like, um, what difference does it make that, it, that we know what's going on in Cameroon or not? Like, we're, we're far away uh, in another country and it doesn't affect Norwegian politics. Why should, why should MFA care to, to meet up here? Why, why is it in our interest as Norwegians or Europeans, um, if we are Norwegians or Europeans, why is it in our interest to, to, to care about what's going on in, in Cameroon? Yeah. I think the answer to your question is, it's rather even you can expand on it to say, why should we know about and care about conflict anywhere uh, where there's crisis and human suffering? And the answer I think is split in two. It's like the, well, let's say Norway is a member of the UN. And as a member of the UN, it has to, has a say in like my organization, Norway is a member and it has a voting right in, in has a right to say, what is the mandate of my organization? And my organization mandate is to uh, help people in need migrants, IDPs, etc. So already they have committed a membership of different agencies that they are part of. They have ratified different um, international conventions. It, 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 is, it is in a sense relevant to this discussion. And then I think just out of humanism, just, just uh, I think Norway uh, or any country cannot you know, with good conscience stand and watch this kind of suffering without partaking in the solution, you know. Um, and then, well, and also the answer to this tend to depend on what side of politics you stand, right? Um, one side of politics might say, well, it's, it's in our interest to help people where they are so they don't come here. You know, migrants, that's the nature of people migrant and move uh, out of need sometimes. You know, if you cannot remain, if you cannot survive where you are, then you have to move. Now, what we talked about is this, like the, the professor in Tromsø University mentioned the, the open borders and yes, of course. So if it doesn't work out in, in Cameroon, you tend to first try the neighboring country and seek refuge there. there. But we also know there is an influx to Europe and um, well, in 2015-2016, we saw, saw a great influx of migrants um, to Europe where the, the, the primary driver of this was a conflict, you know. So there are many reasons for why we should care, why we should know uh, and why we have to participate uh, in, in finding a solution. Uh, as IOM, that is our mandate. That's, that, that is what we do. But if you want to point to government, Norwegian government, Norwegian people, there are many moral and self-interest reasons to say, yes, we should. Um, yeah. Thank you. Uh, maybe I should, maybe I'll add something uh, to what Emil said. Uh, having mentioned the uh, fact that uh, each country or the international system as itself has to, it, its politics, I would like to say that it's, in, it's equally important for uh, Cameroonians to uh, know more about the world and about how the international political system functions. 
Um, because when the when the crisis started, like everyone was uh, thinking that automatically there will be response from from the international community, from all these humanitarian countries that they will flute in there and maybe come to uh, the assistance. Mm -hmm. So I think uh, uh, the way maybe some people appreciate or think about how the international politics functions uh, is it, not exactly uh, how it is. So I think more and more uh, there is also, there is, it's equally important that people understand uh, or educate themselves more about how the international system works. Thank you. Thank you. I think we have to stop there. Uh, thank you, Emil, Gil Gilbert, Clementine, and also Dr. Fumunio for your contributions. And thank you, the Norwegian Council of Africa for uh, trying to shed some more light on what's going on in Cameroon. Um, that's one of the main solutions to, to the conflict. And uh, yeah, and thank you to all those who have listened. Um, Sara, do you want to sum up? Uh, yes, I can do that. Uh, I would like to thank you all on behalf of the organization. Thank you all for attending this uh, event. I would like to give a special thanks to our fantastic panel, uh, Clementine, Andre, Emil Andre, um, Dr. Fumunia, Gilbert, and of course, our dear moderator, Vegard, for um, guiding us through this interesting and um, important event. Uh, a big thanks to the audience for their interesting questions. Uh, hopefully they have gained more knowledge on the internal displacement crisis in the country uh, and some of the challenges that RDPs face. Uh, also, last but not least, thanks to my dear colleagues, Maike, Florian, Aisha, Ingrid, Judith, Berit, and of course, our advisor Hilde for putting together this event. Once again, thank you all. Have a nice evening and stay tuned for um, our events. Bye bye. Thank you.